Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia, and thank you very much for joining us. I'm Laura Kovacs, and I'm pleased to be here. Yad Jassy's enormously successful debut, Homegoing, won the National Book Critics Circle John Leonard Award for Best First Book and the Penn Hemingway Award for a First Book of Fiction. Her new book, Transcendent Kingdom, is a novel of profound scientific and spiritual reflection in which a young woman searches for meaning in the wake of family tragedy. A Wall Street Journal review calls the book laser-like, powerful, focused, daring, and burningly dedicated to the question of meaning. This evening, she'll be joined in conversation with Tamala Edwards, anchor of 6ABC Action News Morning Edition. And now, Ya and Tam, the screen is all yours. Ya, good evening. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Well, having read your book, um, I'm in an interesting place. I loved it, but it was a reminder of how much history and pain people can be carrying on the inside and you just have no idea. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but it was a beautiful book and thank you for it. Um, and for people who may not have read your first book, Homegoing, it, it very different. Um, you know, one was an exploration of the African, African-American experience through the generations and that sense of distance and connectivity at the same time. This is different. It's the study of one woman and her family and her choices and her history and what has happened to her. And as I read the book, you know, obviously people I'm sure ask you about the connections. You um, note a friend who is a scientist and you were fascinated by her work and that informs Gifty's life as a research scientist. Obviously you're also Ghanaian American, grew up in Alabama in an evangelical experience, but your life beyond that, very different, your family structure, your parents, your trajectory, very different. So I wondered about the connective tissue, how you came to the idea of this woman who's dealing with addiction and depression and that family and the inspiration. Cause I loved an interview in which you said your one moment of inspiration as a writer was with Homegoing when you were in Ghana and you were in the slave castle, yeah. but everything else is work. It is coming up with it. So yeah. how do you do that here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's funny that you mentioned that moment of inspiration that I had with Homegoing. Um, that happened in 2009. I had gotten a fellowship to travel to Ghana and conduct research for a novel, um, and I didn't know it was going to be homegoing. At the time, I thought that I wanted to go to Ghana, travel around my mother's hometown, which is in the central region of Ghana, not very far from the Cape Coast Castle, um, because I thought I was going to write a novel about a mother and a daughter. Um, and then I ended up going to the Cape Coast Castle, taking the tour and having my life changed completely um, and homegoing emerged from there. But I think that, that novels are always kind of, the beginnings of novels are always percolating for years and years. And in mm -hmm. hindsight, that idea, that initial idea that I had to write a novel about a mother and a daughter um, came back in this circuitous way because Transcendent Kingdom is, is very much that. Um, but I couldn't have known back, you know, in 2009 when I thought that I was wasting everyone's time and faith and money on this idea that wasn't panning out, that I would return to it in some, in some capacity. Um, after I finished Homegoing, I started working on a novel, a different novel, about a mother and a daughter, a woman who was incredibly religious, raising her daughter in the faith. Um, and it just wasn't working. I didn't really like it. I didn't know what to do. Um, and then my friend Tina, who was getting her PhD at Stanford at the time, she's a friend from Alabama and just happened to also be at Stanford. Um, she, she ended up letting me tour her uh, lab. And that was, that was the beginning of like putting the pieces together. Maybe it's possible to combine this work um, and this thinking around neuroscience with this, um, this intimate story about a mother-daughter relationship. You know, one of the things that the story is Gifty, the main character in her present day life at, at 28, 29, um, in her doctoral work dealing with her depressed mother, but also flashing back to her childhood in various scenes and how they got here. And one of the things that hit me is so often in novels, it's about the ways in which a child can never truly know their parent, that the parent has mm -hmm. sacrificed to get them to where they are. 
But what hit me in this novel were the ways in which this mother can never know her children because she, is, she grew up in a place where she was surrounded by Africanists, not just Blackness, but Africanists and the comfort of that. And the everyday experience for her two children is so different and so crushing. Yeah. And she almost has no idea what she has put on them. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. They're so isolated. Um, I think of it as isolation within isolation. So not only are they immigrants, but they're also living in the predominantly white part of, of town. So they're not even, they don't even have other black people around them. And on top of that, Gifty's mother spends, you know, most of her waking hours working outside of the home, taking care of other people's family members. So when she returns to her own house, she has very little left to give to Gifty and her brother, and she doesn't know them very well. And that the ways that she might get to know them are often kind of cut off for her. Um, and so I think of the, the kind of faith um, and the caretaking between these two women as the last language uh, that they have in common um, because they don't really see each other. They're very similar, um, but they don't know it. They can't, they can't reach each other somehow. And, and she, uh, the mother is a home health aide and she deals with all of people's ridiculousness and the way that's, ways that they treat her and the crushing, what it means to be a single mother and the bills but the fact that she can't see that the everyday racism, I mean, as I read the book as an African-American myself, and I've heard you talk about this, your own trajectory, like it happens to you and you almost don't think about it because if you thought about it, you'd break apart. Yeah. And I think in reading the book, I wondered why I didn't break apart or you didn't break apart or these children didn't break apart. And this mother, if she had known all she wanted was safety, she would have grabbed these kids and run in the other direction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she definitely would have. I mean, I think of her as a character, she's so single-minded um, and so driven, and we never really get to know what exactly brought her to America. Um, all we hear from Gifty and that Gifty hears from her mother is that she wanted something a little bit better. Um, and so she lands in this place and she doesn't really think about what that isolation is going to do for her children, not just in terms of all the, the loneliness that's involved in that, but in the lack of community, the lack of um, black support that might have helped their children through some of um, the racist circumstances that they're experiencing. And so it is, it is a wonder that Gifty and, and her mother make it out of these situations uh, the traumatic situations intact or relatively intact, given all that they go through. In the book, Gifty very much so is dealing as a child with the dynamics of her family, with the dynamics of her church and her hometown, and then as an adult with her research and what it means. But she does have an Af a boyfriend at one point who seems to be African American. But you know, novelists make choices, and the African American community isn't easy either. We have our own judgments and expectations and issues. And you did not bring that in for Gifty. There's not an African American experience in, in Alabama. There's not an experience at Stanford. She almost exists outside of that. And I wondered why you made the choice. Did you feel as though it was enough trying to deal with her family and the way she punishes herself that you couldn't add one more thing? Was there a reason why you don't see her other than the boyfriend Raymond pretty much at all dealing with the African-American community? Yeah, um, I don't think it, it was necessarily that it would have been too much, though maybe you know subconsciously I was thinking that it might have been too much, but more that I wanted to highlight that sense again of, of total isolation of like not knowing who and where to turn to. Um, Gifty grows up in this predominantly white part of Huntsville, Alabama, which is actually a pretty racially, um, racially diverse uh, city, um, though de facto segregated. Um, and because of this, her frame of reference is whiteness. Her like understanding of America is whiteness um, and herself as defined outside of that whiteness. And so I think when she gets to college and starts to meet people like Raymond, that's actually the first time that she's interacting um, with African-Americans on a, on a more intimate level um, because she is one of the only um, black people period. 
um, when she's growing up. And so I think leaving out the interaction, more interactions with, um, with other black people was an opportunity to just show that level, that kind of crushing loneliness, that crushing isolation. One of the things that I think about for this book um, is the, the kind of road not taken version of Gifty's life, wherein Gifty's mother had seen a black church first and gone to that and raised her children there. Like what would Gifty and Nana's futures have been um, if, if they had been surrounded um, by people who worshiped in the same way as them. Um, but given that that didn't happen, here's this other path and we get to see Gifty in all of her, her loneliness and her, her brokenness. And I've heard you in other places talk about your own trajectory on this of like Gifty who thinks if I can be good enough, smart enough, I can convert people, I can show them their ideas about blackness, et cetera, are wrong. And I've heard you talk about it in terms of current times that you realize, wait a second, that's your work, you hold that. Yeah. I don't need to do this. And I, I would love for people listening to hear a little bit more about that journey for yourself and how you thought about bringing that to Gifty because it feels with her, it's not so much, wait a second, white people, this is crazy, you deal with it as much as this is evidence that God may not exist. If you mm. may behave like this, then maybe I need to rethink this whole God thing. And that's how she gets through it. Yeah, yeah. Um, for me, I think, you know, so much of, of my childhood, because I did grow up similarly to Gifty, I was raised on in the predominantly white part of Huntsville, Alabama, um, and didn't experience um, or didn't like spend a lot of time in community with African Americans until I got to college. Um, and so I wasn't really kind of well versed in the history of, uh, of blackness in America. It was something that was taught to me partially in schools, but then something that I had to seek out on my own as I started to desire more knowledge. Um, and so for years, I think I fell into that, um, that fallacy of thinking that black respectability politics were like the, was the way to get ahead. Like if I could only be good enough, then perhaps I could earn um, earn people's approval, earn people's acceptance. Um, and it wasn't until I started to kind of seek more um, education around the subjects that I understood this, um, that this is completely false, that it's not on me um, to do any work, amount of work, um, that I did not do anything to deserve the treatment that I was getting, and therefore I could not do anything to get out of the treatment that I was receiving. But you're right, I think for Gifty, um, it comes through the church somehow when she starts to witness the treatment that her brother especially is receiving at the hands of a community that claims to love him when he's on the basketball court, um, but then quickly turns, uh, mm -hmm. turns away from him when they see him outside, when they see him struggling, um, it shakes something in her. Um, and the thing that is shaken deeply is her ability to believe in a loving God. She can't reconcile her brother's addiction, her brother's pain with a God that cares about them and cares about their family, nor can she reconcile the treatment of her church members who are also um, all white. Um, can she reconcile that treatment uh, with with a God who cares equally about all people. And so how it manifests in Gifty is with a break in the faith. Um, she she describes it as something that happens really suddenly. Um, one, one minute there's a, a God who has the whole world in his hand and the next minute she's plummeting. Uh, that's, how she, that's how she feels it happens. Um, but I think it's very much related to her kind of burgeoning understandings of, of racism and how it's impacting her own life and the life of her family. I wanted to talk a little bit about Gifty's mother. And one of the scenes that stays with me is her exhausted, sitting at the table, trying to figure bills out all by herself. And you almost imagine like that little baby bird that they found and she said, everything in life feels pain. Yeah. That she is like that little bird by herself at that table. and. In retrospect, do you want people to read the book and see this as a woman who would have always probably struggled with mental health or a woman who life broke her, what it meant to come and be by yourself, what it meant to 
have a child who dies, what it is to be so far away from your sustenance, for life to just, just getting from one day to the next to be hard, that life broke her and that's why she's here. It's depression. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's, it's that. It's the latter. Um, perhaps she would have had a propensity uh, toward this. She might, have, she might have ended up with mental health issues regardless. Um, but I, I think of her as this kind of, I think of her sister, Aunt Esther, who we meet um, when, when Gifty uh, goes to, to Ghana um, as, as a foil for her. Gifty talks about seeing how happy her aunt is um, uh, when they're leaving, when Gifty is going back to the States and they're parting, um, her aunt hugs her and tells her that she's proud of her. And Gifty realizes that this is what her mother could have been if life hadn't worn her down in so many ways. Um, not just the, the single parenthood, the, the constant working, the immigration, the isolation, all of these factors I think helped to contribute to, um, to her depression, um, which is not to say that, um, you know, that it, that it might not have gone another way, um, but we, we just can't know. For me, I think it's the compounding circumstances um, that, that contributed to, to her illness. I wanted to talk to you about writing a mother because we all have these ideas of mothers, especially black mothers and what they're supposed to be. I got 15 cents, but I made a dollar. I love you no matter what. <laughs> source yeah. of strength and endless love. This mother is complicated. She loves her children so deeply, um, chastises herself for not letting her ex-husband take Nana back to Ghana, would he have lived? But she's a difficult one. She doesn't say, I love you. When she finally says it, Gifty laughs because she doesn't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. She notes that when they were hurt as children, she was never one to kiss it and make it better, to pull them into her arms for a hug. Um, you know, that she talks about callousness, but callousness covers a wound, which I thought was a sweet way of putting it. But it reminded me of another Stanford girl, Jessamyn Ward, mm -hmm. who in Sing Unburied Sing, she said the toughest character was the mother who readers would come up and fight with her. Like this is not right. who a mother is supposed to be. And she said she herself had a hard time getting that character written. Did you sometimes have a hard time getting the mother written because she's not our conception of what a mother is supposed to be, that sort of tough at a distance? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. She's an incredibly difficult character to pin down on the page um, because of all of the reasons that you just mentioned. She's um, she's reticent. Um, she's keeping her kids at bay um, and she's keeping everyone else at bay as well. And so you can't, um, because we're with Gifty through Gifty's perspective the entire time and Gifty doesn't know her, we, the reader, are also at a remove from her. We'll never really understand what it was. I think that there's some kind of trauma um, from her time in Ghana that keeps her from talking to her children about what her life looked like back then. Um, why is it that Gifty doesn't know that she has an aunt until she arrives um, in Ghana? That feels like something to me. And so there were all these little things where, um, where I had to figure out ways to see around what the mother was willing to say, what, what she, the care that she was willing to show, because the love isn't explicit and it's not it's not warm in the way that we're used to seeing mothers be warm on the page. Um, and so how do you show that there is still love there um, when it's coming across in this, in this difficult way? And yet she has capabilities. There's a scene where someone has died and the family is folding her into their arms and mm -hmm. Gifty is watching her mother who never hugs, hug this family and have this patience and this kindness. Why could she do that with strangers, but not her own children who clearly needed her? Mm. Well, I mean, partly it's, it's, it's what the job required of her. And like she was getting paid to take care of these people. And so I imagine her to be the kind of person who like Gifty is invested in being good at her work. And part of being good at her work um, meant taking good care of people and being kind of warmer toward um, the patients in her care. But I think the other thing is just the amount of time 
that home health aides spend outside of the home with the people mm. that they're taking care of. Um, Gifty talks about the fact that her mother would sometimes work uh, a shift with one person and then go work the night shift with another family. And so there were periods of Gifty's life where she wasn't seeing her mother um, at all for most of the day. Um, and so in that way, they become strange to each other. And yet she's not, her mother isn't strange to these families. She's not a stranger to these families that she's spending hours on end with. Um, in some ways, they probably know her more intimately than Gifty does. They see her every day, day in, day out. They get to talk to her in ways that Gifty and Nana cannot. Um, and so I think that moment when Gifty is at the funeral and she's seeing uh, she's seeing the way that, that these family members are kind of doting on her mother. She's aware of the fact that her mother is kind of a separate person uh, outside of the definition of mother, um, a person that she can't see, that she has not fully seen. Did you, as you were writing the book, have your own trajectory in terms of how you understood addiction and mental illness? Because there's a moment as an adult where Gifty looks back and she realizes she spent years saying, thinking about her brother as only, who would he have been if he wasn't an addict? Mm -hmm. And she really chastises herself because she realizes she's left all the other things he was out by focusing on his addiction. And it made me wonder if that was a journey that you yourself took as you mm -hmm. tried to understand addiction, depression, and the characters in this book, and that you wanted the reader to think about. Yes, it was. I mean, I think, you know, I, as much as I researched the novel, as much as I could kind of intellectually tell myself your brain is an organ, um, you still, it still bears repeating. Like it, you, you, I find myself even still today, like having to remind myself um, that, that when a brain is experiencing some kind of abnormal um, situation. It's the same as if you know your your lungs were working differently, your kidneys were working differently, but it feels different because our brain makes up our personality, and we feel like we should have a choice over the things that are happening to us um, on a on a personal level. And so, researching addiction from the perspective of um, someone who studies it as a scientist was really illuminating for me, um, especially because Gifty has this personal connection to it. So she can separate it, but she also can't. Um, there's that moment where she's talking about um, the breakthrough that she had in her research, where she finally gets this mouse um, to stop pressing the lever, to stop mm -hmm. um, being addicted to, uh, to the insurer. And what she thinks is, why didn't Nana get better for me? Um, so she understands that the science works, that it can work, um, that there is something going on in the brain that causes addiction. And yet still what her reaction is this very personal, uh, this personal reaction of why didn't he choose to be better? Um, so those moments, I think, were, were really interesting for me to write and to think about, um, particularly as I was doing my research, because I think it is something that's really hard for, for us um, to, to, to reckon with um, that addiction, particularly opioid addiction, um, is something that is affecting a part of your brain that you can't control um, what you want to control, even when you want to control it. You know, it's interesting you bring up that scene. The word I wrote down about it was bittersweet. Mm -hmm. That on one hand, you know, she's done all these experiments and sat there looking at an empty page and will she ever get done and then she gets the mouse to stop wanting the op the insurer. Yeah. And it's a triumph, but it's it's too late. All of her learning, she'll never be able to use that with Nana. Yeah. And what difference would it have made if he was still around and she had finally gotten that mouse to put it down? Right. Right. I mean, I think that's that's it. Like she all of this work that she's doing to try to solve a problem. Um, a problem that exists like in the past. Um, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, if we could talk to Gifty herself, she would talk about how excited she is for the research to help other people. Um, but the reason that she got into it, even if she protests it, is, is she wanted to save her brother um, and she can't save him retroactively. Um, and so there's, there's, great, there's great sadness there for her. 
And, you know, Gifty is an interesting character because when she goes back in time, there's just an openness there. There's a rawness, there's a nakedness in Gifty as a child and even Gifty behind the surface as an adult, but the way she presents in the outside world is keeping everybody at bay. Friendships are lost. She won't tell anybody the truth. She ruins relationships. And I kept wondering, is this taught in the end? Do we become our parents? And just as she saw her body change and felt like she was becoming her mother, is this what she knows or is she punishing herself? That's a really good question. I think she's punishing herself. Well, I think it's probably a combination of both, but I think partly it's it's this coping mechanism that she's developed in order to um, in order to get through the chaos of her childhood. These walls that she puts up um, to keep people at bay are in part because she has so many areas that that hurt, and she feels that if anyone got close to that kind of raw wire, she wouldn't she wouldn't recover from it. She couldn't withstand it. Um, and so I think I think in order to to avoid punishment she further punishes herself. She wants to be close to Anne, to Raymond. Um, you can see that yearning to be close to them. And yet the mechanism that allows her to do so is faulty, perhaps because she never learned how to from her family, but also I think because she doesn't think that she deserves to. Um, and, and that's one of the, the great sadnesses of the novel is all the people that she pushes away because she doesn't believe herself to deserve that kind of affection and attention. There are lots of things in the book that I almost see it like Easter eggs or little things you found in the research and you were like, I'm getting that in. Yeah. Um, one of which was the origin of the word logos, which mm -hmm. we've been led to believe is in the beginning there was the word and the word was God. Mm -hmm. And Gifty finds out that's not quite it. And I want you to tell everybody listening what logos really means and what went through your head when you found it out because it's really it fits with gifty but it's just a profound different way of thinking about something we've heard a million times yeah um so it's something more like like premise or um question idea um something more like that than word and interestingly it's funny that you bring up that moment um we we're talking earlier about the ways that my that my um, my own biography matches with Gifties, but I remember hearing about this in a church sermon uh, when I was a teenager, and it kind of blowing my mind and thinking, wait, what? Like there are things that are that are kind of not not completely accurately <laughs> translated in the Bible. How did I not know this? Um, and I feel like it's one of those things that you do as a writer where you kind of squirrel away little tidbits that might be useful or interesting um, to, to have them pop up in something later, but I, I never forgot it. Um, and so when I was writing this character and thinking about the kind of person he, she is, a person who is deeply invested in, I think, searching out um, truth and thinking about mystery um, and questions of, of why we're here and what it means to be alive. It just felt, it felt like the perfect place to drop in that, that little piece, um, that little pearl that I had gotten all those years ago. In the beginning, God said, why don't you consider an idea? Which <laughs> yeah. is so much more expansive than in the beginning, he said, here's how it's gonna go. Right. <laughs> um, right. I wondered about your own history with um, evangelical faith and how much that played into the book. Did you yourself also go into it? Are you still an evangelical? Did you let go of your faith much as Gifty did? Have you examined it in a different way? Where did this whole thing find you? Yeah, like Gifty, I grew up um, in the church. I grew up Pentecostal, um, um, raised by both of my parents who were devout. Um, and it was a a place that I spent, you know, multiple days a week um, going to services. We went Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday for youth service. Um, outside of school and home, it was the most formative place of my life. Um, but at the same time, um, I had 
parents who were incredibly uh, invested in making sure that we were still asking bigger questions um, and parents who were really kind of politically minded. And so there was always, my dad, I remember would always kind of be whispering in Shui while the pastor would talk about how we wouldn't have these religions had it not been for colonialism. So I'm always <laughs> getting these like side lectures in addition to, um, to the sermons. And so I think that that started in me a desire to kind of question the things that I was, that I was hearing at the church. Um, this was all also happening um, in the context of, of moving to Alabama. Uh, so when we first got to America, we lived in Columbus, Ohio. We were members of the African Christian Church there, which was half Nigerian, half Ghanaian. Um, so it felt like a very soft landing. And then each place we lived in subsequently, the churches got different and the makeups of the churches, the racial makeup of the churches got different. And so by the time we got to Alabama, um, we were the, the only black family at the church. Um, eventually there was another black family. Um, and I, I started to notice in my teen years that I was developing like a political consciousness of an ideology that did not match up to the one that was being taught to me at the church. Um, and um, it came to a head for me very specifically. It, it wasn't like Gifty story at all. Um, for me, the, the turning point was the day that a youth pastor told us that he had had a vision um, the, the night before of two tornadoes coming to destroy the earth. One was homosexuality and the other was abortion. And I think I was 14 at the time and I just found it such a preposterous thing to say when all of the <laughs> things, like all of the tragic things that were going on around us at that time, we had just like started going to... Um, we had just entered Iraq uh, for war. I just thought this is this is absurd that this is what this man wants to talk about. And I called my parents and asked them to come pick me up. Um, and I and I never went back uh, to to a youth service again. Um, and so I think for me the the break wasn't it wasn't a personal one like Gifty. It wasn't for personal reasons. It was more for um, this feeling that I was developing a, a a politics that was very different from the one that my church wanted me to have. Are your parents still, your family in general, still very involved in that sort of Pentecostal tradition? No, they aren't. In fact, they now go to Catholic church of all, of all things. Um, but a I lot of things to of, learn. <laughs> a lot of things to learn. I think they just didn't want to, they, they can't give up faith entirely, um, but they wanted less of the, less of the dogma. And it's interesting you talk about the pastor and the twin tornadoes in the book gifty makes passing reference to relationships with women she's close friends with a woman named Anne, and mentions that it does have a romantic tinge and she's got a crush on a cashier at the supermarket yeah. and coming from an african tradition coming from a southern tradition coming from an evangelical tradition you're like there are three different levels here in which she could be freaking out about this and it's just like, and today is Tuesday. She doesn't even stop to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. And that was an interesting choice. Like, how can she be so freaked out by Christianity? And this aspect, she doesn't even give it a paragraph. Or you, you yeah. didn't think she needed a paragraph on this. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I thought about how to portray those moments in Gifty's life. Um, and what I, what I came down to is that she it's an area that she wouldn't want to examine, that she wouldn't want to touch with a 10 foot pole. Um, and so rather than think it to death the way she does everything else, she just kind of lets it be because to try to peel back um, the peel back and, and kind of look under the surface, I think would bring up too much for her because you're right, there are multiple layers of resistance um, to her having a relationship with a woman. And so I think ultimately what she decides is it's just, let's just not talk about it, not think about it. Um, it's there, but not there. Just one more thing in the big bag of things that she just pushes under the rug. Yeah. Um, you know, a difficult chapter is a very short chapter, chapter 35. Um, Gifty has a habit of writing in her journal and it's a very short chapter where she essentially says, Nana die already. 
And I figured that that was probably a choice you had to really wrestle with in whether or not she would be that explicit. She would write that down. She would say that out loud. Yeah. Yeah. Gifty's journal entries were really, um, were a real great opportunity for me, I think, because for so much of the novel, we see Gifty, but we're not really getting an honest version of her. She's narrating herself to us. Um, and as we know, she's a difficult person to get to know. She pushes people away. Um, and so the journals felt like the opportunity to see Gifty at her most vulnerable. And part of that vulnerability comes from the fact that she's a child. Um, and so there's an innocence there. Um, part of it comes from the fact that she's using these code names, so she feels more comfortable telling the truth. Um, but I think, but I think that moment in that chapter where she basically wishes her brother's death feels like the most childlike and the most um, kind of atrocious thing that Gifty could have done as a child in that moment. Uh, but it felt like it just felt like her innocence on the page. Um, and her reaction to it after the fact that she flushes the, the page down the toilet, like it felt um, like a kind of a kind of innocence um, that I wanted to have for her, um, even though she's, you know, you know, wishing this horrible thing, she's doing so in a way that felt to me like very, very vulnerable, um, considering her lack of vulnerability throughout the rest of this novel. I think for many of us, part of the adult journey is learning to look on ourselves with kindness. Um, you know, would you talk to anybody else in the world the way you talk to yourself? And for Gifty, those journals as an adult, when she pulls them out from under the mattress and her reaction is pure horror yeah. as she goes back and she looks at what she's read. And I just remember thinking, she cannot wrap herself in an embrace, let alone her mother can't do it. Yeah. She cannot be kind to herself. Yeah, yeah, it's, it is, I think, one of, the, one of the things that made the ending of the novel so important to me is that we see Gifty um, for over 250 pages, just um, berating herself, second guessing herself, um, being harsh with herself um, you don't ever get to see her at rest like uh, at, at Stanford they talk to the freshmen often about what they called uh, I, like the duck syndrome um, by hmm. which they meant a, a yeah they would talk to us about the idea of somebody looking on the surface as though they're very placid and everything is going well and then under the surface their feet are paddling like this and I think Gifty, um, Gifty exemplifies that to me. She's a character who looks as though she's got everything together, is, is perfectly content. And then under the surface, she's just doing this the whole time. Um, and so there's a lack of, uh, of peace in her life. Um, and, and so that ending where she gets a little peace um, felt important to me. It's interesting that she never explicitly says, I'm afraid of becoming my mother yeah. because there's such a sense of exhaustion. You know, her mother's exhausted from what life has put her through and mm. Gifty is exhausting herself and putting herself on that trajectory. But she never explicitly comes out and says, if I don't cut this out, yeah. you know, though, I mean, in little ways, she'll say, you know, I'm looking at the bedroom door, wondering one day if I'll be on the other side of it, but she doesn't really put it together. Yeah. Yeah. I think she's, she's aware enough to know that there are parts of her that are reflections of her mother. And she's so scared of those things that it, it goes back to like Gifty being a character who can't name, um, who can't name the things that she fears. Um, or can't name her worries. It's this, it's almost like a superstition. Like if I talk about it, if I think about it, um, then I'll have to deal with it. Then it will have to be true. Um, and so her her own depression, which I think is the other piece of this novel, Gifty herself to me is a character who's struggling, um, going back to the paddling duck. Um, but she can't she can't name it. Uh, and so to see her mother in the bed and think. Will I one day be that? Will that 
will that one day be my fate um, is devastating to her, but she doesn't want to address it. You know, one of the reasons I love books so much is that books give us back to ourselves. You read a line and you go, that's it. That is it. There was a line in here that did that for me. And essentially Gifty is like having a, a mental freak out when her advisor says, well, what do you want? And she's like, everything in a pony. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, I want a mansion and I want to have kids and I, I want everything to be fine. And I want this and I want that. And then she, in the end, she says, I want everything and I want less. And I said, yes, mm. I profoundly understand that sentence. Yeah, yeah. I think if, yeah, it's, it's the most honest that we see Gifty in that moment too, is this understanding um, that she is, is, that she just wants so much out of life, that the part of her that is seeking to do this work um, the part of her that, you know, wants to take care of her mother, that all of this is just a kind of desire to fill her cup. Um, and yet it's, it's weighing her down. Um, and so that's where everything and less comes. But I wondered play. if that was something that was in your soul or that as you looked mm. out at the world in general, I want everything and I want less. It was a encapsulation Mm. of something you were feeling or that you saw everyone around you feeling? You know, probably, probably at the time that I was thinking about this novel or working on this novel, I might, I might have said yes to that. Um, though I feel, I feel like so many of the things that I wanted, so many of the things that I was striving for and felt like I couldn't attain, um, I'm less concerned about them now um, as I as I get older, as I work more um, in fiction. And I think partly writing this book, um, which did force me to confront some some of my own tendencies, um, was really helpful in that way. Like I could come to the place that I think that I think of Gifty coming to at the end of the novel, which is like that last pose in yoga when you're just lying. <laughs> lying still on the mat like that's what I wanted to feel that everything and less at the same time um, and I think I can access it uh, in a way that Gifty uh, in, the, in that moment in the novel cannot. There's a beautiful moment in the novel as she thinks about her brother and about religion and she says being saved is not about a lack of sin being saved is someone saying, walk with me. Mm. And I, I, I just, I don't even know what the question is around that, but I mm. wonder how you got there and what that means. What a different sense of salvation that we're not looking for someone to say that you're blameless or perfect, but it's okay that you're a sinner. You won't be by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. Like I, I think for me, after all of those years of um, being in the church, of thinking about my own faith, one of the things that that I hold dear is the fact that I did believe that I was faithful. Uh, I spent, like Gifty, I did have this, I think, skewed idea that part of the point of religion was to try to be as perfect as possible, as blameless as possible, um, to, as they say, like, be like Jesus, and recognizing that instead of having that be the goal, um, part, of, part of attaining some semblance of comfort and peace is recognizing that you can't ever do that. Um, but rather that you need help, that you need all of these people around you. You need this community um, in order to kind of let you um, walk the path that you want to, to walk. Like that felt to me um, like a better way of thinking about the, those years in the church, a better way of thinking about faith. Um, so I, I wanted that for Gifty. So the ending, the resolution, the last chapter was a total shocker for me because I thought, you know, we're just sliding down here. Her mom's going to kill herself or Gifty's not going to yeah. get her paper done or we're just going to end in a horrid place. Yeah. And you made a very different decision for her. Why was that? 
You know, interestingly, when I first finished a, a first draft of the novel, uh, I ended it with Gifty in her car in the parking lot of that ice cream parlor in San Francisco, just wondering if everything was going to be okay. So I ended it right before what I think of as the coda, the little the little chapter at the end. Um, and and it, partly it was because I didn't know. I didn't know how things were going to turn out for Gifty. As you said, like so many of, th of the things in her life were in free fall. Her mother doesn't seem to be improving. She's not working on her paper. Her relationship with Catherine is kind of tattering. Um, her relationship with Han, who knows where that will go. Um, and so I didn't know where Gifty was going to be. And I remember sharing it, the, the novel, that draft of the novel with, um, with some of my early readers. Um, who were like, you cannot end this here. <laughs> uh, this is not enough of an ending. Um, and so when I went back to think about what I wanted for Gifty, um, it was less this idea that everything was going to be wrapped up, you know, with a bow, the, as she said, the like marriage house on a hill kids thing that her mother wanted for her, but rather that she would feel for once in her life as though it didn't matter if everything was perfectly aligned. It didn't matter if she uh, had all of the answers that she could finally accept that asking the questions was enough, that it was enough to just be the kind of person who was seeking um, and that everything else could kind of fall away. And so that's how I think of the last chapter. Um, you know, we do find out that her mother's better. We do find out that she got the job, but more so than that, I think we find Gifty at a place of ease and she hasn't been in a place of ease uh, for the entire novel. In the end, did she get something better with her mother? Did her mother get better? Did they get to have a friendship? I mean, we see her mother lives longer and comes to the end and we don't know yeah. what she dies from but it's not the suicide that Gifty's afraid of. And I just yeah. wondered if in your mind, what sort of happened between those two? In my mind, their relationship doesn't, doesn't greatly improve. It doesn't, it doesn't really change in any significant ways. Like I think that they remain two people who are staring at each other from opposite sides of a room, trying to know each other, but not, not ultimately being able to do that. Um, but I think when Gifty's mother says to her, and Chui Ebeye, it will be all right, um, that she keeps that, that both of them keep that um, as, the, as a kind of guiding force. And so um, they're not, they're not, you know, they're not at peace with each other, but they are taking care of each other in the ways that they, that they know how. You've written two very different novels, and I wondered in the end, at this moment, which experience you preferred and which direction you think you're, you're going to go in the future? You had one where they were quicker chapters, mm. sprawling a lot of different things, and then another story that was very focused and very different, and wondered if you were left with a preference. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. I think, I think that Homegoing was easier to write um, easier to write a, uh, easier to revise, harder to do a first draft, um, mostly because the research that it took was so all encompassing that I felt like I was always in my head as I was writing the first draft. Transcendent Kingdom, the, the first draft came out very smoothly and then it felt impossible to revise. Once I, once I finished it, it felt like a game of Jenga. Like if I, if I changed one thing, the entire thing would topple. Um, and so they, they both have their pros and cons, but I think I, I love a book that's juggling as many things as possible, that kind of maximalist um, idea uh, will, will be something that I try to carry on with me. I like the short chapters, so maybe I will stick to that um, for, for another one. Um, I was surprised by how much I liked writing in the first person for a novel length work. I had never written in first person other than a short story here and there. Um, I, I don't know if I will do that again, but it's nice to know that I can. 
Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I feel like each novel now having done two, I feel like I can say that each novel will require something new of me. And it's hard to know what that will be until I confront it. Do you feel as though you've worked out the story between a mother and a daughter or that that's something that you still feel you want to come back to? I imagine that I will come back to it. I think there, there are, you know, three or four things that I'm always circling and family relationships is definitely one of them. Like generational trauma is one of them. Religion is one of them. Faith is one of them. Um, so I, I don't think this will be the last mother and daughter that you see from me. I wanted to ask you a question about writing about race in this day and age, because I think when you're African-American, it's always there. It's the wallpaper. Yeah. And then you've got to decide, is it just beige wallpaper or is it like Paisley wallpaper? What are we going yeah. to do with this? And, you know, Toni Morrison famously said that the work of racism is to keep you from doing work. It's to keep you fixated on what it's doing. And one of the things I liked about this book is that race was a factor, but it wasn't the biggest factor or the only factor mm -hmm. that at its heart, it was a story about a girl and her mother and her brother and wondering about how you think about the role of race in your writing and where you want to place it on the table. Yeah. There's a really excellent essay that uh, appeared in Vulture in 2020 by a, a writer named Lauren Michelle Jackson, um, who said, you, you she's said so race good. Is the, she's excellent. Um, you said race is wallpaper. And she said race was like the weather. Um, and I've been thinking about that for, you know, a, a year or more since, since I read that piece, because I think, um, I think it's it's a good way of thinking about what you can do, what you should do, what your responsibility is to do with race in your work. Like it's just, it's happening all the time. Um, whether you address it explicitly in your novel or not, you are always addressing it. And I think this even, even for white writers, right, writers of it, that, you know, the absence of the discussion is itself a kind of presence we're all writing about race, whether we think we are or not. Um, and so it's, it's hard for me to know how it will show up again. Um, I think of Homegoing as a book that was very explicit in its desire to think about institutionalized racism and Transcendent Kingdom is less explicit, but still very much interested um, in thinking about how, how racism impacts the life of a, of a family. Um, so I know it will be there because it is the weather. Um, I just don't know what form it will take. Wouldn't it be nice if it was a sunny day and not always raining? Yes, <laughs> only. <laughs> no, we're going to get that anytime soon. Um, yeah. I think we have come to the end of our time together. I could talk to you for another three hours, but I guess I'll have to wait for the next book. <laughs> yeah, um, did I not so ask nice. you, I always ask writers, is there anything that I didn't ask you about the book that kicks around in your head that you think is important that you would want to share to, with the people who are listening? Hmm. Um, nothing, nothing comes to mind, no. no. Well, thank you again and get back to work because now of course <laughs> we're all gonna talk about what comes next. Yes, of course, thank you, <laughs> this was wonderful. All right, have a wonderful night.